Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can be here together again this morning as we open your word, as we examine um, the message for this time. And we pray for each person who is studying these things. We invite your presence into our lives and that you can be with us in our day-to-day -day struggle with self. And we pray, Lord, that as we continue to look at Daniel's last vision, that you can guide in the study where we should go, what we should do, and uh, reveal to us the things that we need to see. Be with each person, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so for the last two days, we were looking at uh, Jeff's article uh, dealing with Daniel chapter 2 in relation to the eighth is of the seven. And, um, you know, Heidi and I have talked about it a little bit, trying to understand exactly how people are perceiving the article. And um, we, just to, to review briefly, we know that in the article, what Jeff is arguing is based upon the potter's clay and then the miry clay, that this is a progression of corruption um, and that uh, the potter's clay refers to the period of Smyrna and the miry clay uh, refers to the period of Pergamus in which the Sunday law, Constantine's Sunday law occurred. And since uh, Christ um, set up his kingdom of grace when he was crucified, that we can say that the stone smote the foot of the image in the time of Christ, which would include Pergamus. And uh, because of this, he's then going to draw out of Daniel chapter 2 a um, four kingdoms that are types, that is, of, of the four last kingdoms. So that is Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome become types of Papal Rome, the United States, the UN, and then Papal Rome again, being the eighth kingdom in, in its resurrected state. Now, we can agree that uh, how we have understood these kingdoms, the seven and then the eight, is, is correct in an application of it. What we can't see is that Daniel chapter 2 supports that. That is, Daniel chapter 2 doesn't go contrary to that. It just doesn't say anything about it. And I have a hard time, personally, accepting that Daniel chapter 2 was fulfilled in the time of Christ in the Roman, pagan Roman period. And that then becomes the type of what's going to happen in the Omega. So that would be the Alpha, and then the Omega would be those latter four kingdoms. <clears throat> so, I mean, the two things, of course, that we could point out that are wrong with the article just in its uh, assumptions, the one is that miry clay refers to dirty clay rather than just a clod of clay, and that potter's clay refer refers to a pure clay rather than just a potter's clod, as the Hebrew would simply state. The other thing is to say that in the time of Pergamus, um, if that is the miry clay, that is the church craft and state craft, the mingling of church craft and state craft, uh, the iron and the, the clay, the miry clay, that the crucifixion in the time of Christ, marking the beginning of the kingdom, would make sense. Like I, I would have a hard time saying, how can you have this event that's in the first church, Ephesus? Um, how can you say that that happens in the time of Pergamus? How can you say that this, because if the stone smites the foot of the image in the time of Christ before Smyrna and Pergamus, how can, how can that be? 
it, you understand the the point there. Hi, Dwight. So um, I didn't see when you came in exactly, but we're just reviewing what what the problems were with the the argument of Daniel two being uh, fulfilled in the time of Christ. So right. can so can people see that it doesn't make sense to have the 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 stone strike the foot of the image in the time of Christ, but say that that's in the period of Pergamus. And even sort of to mix, you know, the, the seven churches here with Daniel chapter two, I have problems with. I mean, just. These are two different, completely different illustrations of something. Do people understand? Does anybody comment on that? Well, as I have been considering this, we've, you know, there have always been difficulties in explaining also the Day of Atonement. And our belief has been that the Day of Atonement began on October 22nd, 1844. Yeah. Does this have a parallel with the Day of Atonement, this understanding of when this stone strikes the feet? Okay, so in his, I, I'm not sure if I'm 100% sure what you're asking, but in his paper, he tries to say it doesn't happen in 1798 and it doesn't happen in 1844. And I actually would disagree. I think it's actually in 1844 that uh, we have the Day of Atonement and that uh, that's when the stone strikes the foot of the image, to be honest. That's the way that I've always understood it, whether it's correct or not. Um, um I could agree with you that the stone strikes the image in 1844, but could we use the concept that the stone is cut out without hands in 1798? No, I don't think so. But I mean, I, I think I understand what you're saying, because you're saying that this stone represents the church. Right. But that's where I, I wouldn't put it until October 22, 1844. So I wouldn't put it in 1798. I mean, I know what you're saying, but I don't think that this stone that smites the foot of the image can be other thing, anything other than the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I wouldn't put it as the Millerites. Okay, but we're not, I, I still looked that there were true-hearted believers during the Millerites. Yeah, but that's always been too hard to believe yourself. So it, it just has to do with the idea of the third angel's message and the day of atonement, that the, during the day of atonement, that's when we see this stone cut out without hands. All right. That, that's that's my understanding. And that's been an understanding for, I don't know, 40 years that I've had, pretty much ever since I've been a Adventist. <laughs> understood the sanctuary and down to chapter two but so i don't think he gives an argument why it can't be 1798 and why it can't be october 22 1844 he doesn't give to me that it's just he dismisses it and i'm not sure why but um the thing is he's he's arguing that in the time of pergamus we have church craft and statecraft we can agree right. with that. Agreed. Okay. And, and so he's taking that and saying, well, that becomes typical of the church craft and the state craft at the end of the world. And I can even agree with that. Right? That, that what happens with the Sunday law in 321 is definitely typical of the Sunday law. We can all agree with that. Yes. Agreed. Okay. What I can't agree with is the idea that the foot of the image smiting in the time of Christ is, is in the time of Pergamus. Just because it's in the Roman, Roman pagan period. 
because if you're going to have the foot of the image smiting and smiting it, the the stone fight smites the foot of the image at the time of Christ, and you have these different churches, you 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 don't even have the miry clay yet, because you're saying that the miry clay is in the time of Pergamos, and that it's potter's clay in Smyrna. It doesn't really address Ephesus. It just to me, it's just not a logical conclusion it, it it just you know i mean we can obviously say that in daniel chapter 2 that there is a sense in which christ like we know that christ sets up his kingdom with grace but is that what's being addressed in daniel chapter 2 or is this addressing the end of the world and it really appears to be addressing the end of the world destroying those kingdoms not just Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, pagan, but all of the kingdoms of the world, right? So you have to put it at the end of the world. You can't put it at the time of Christ. But but especially even if you try to to put it there, how do you explain Pergamos as being in the time of Christ? It, it just I can't make heads nor tails out of that type of thinking. It just doesn't follow logically. I mean, if you're arguing that the foot of the that the stone smites the foot of the image in 538 or 508 or something like that, you know, during the time that pagan Rome still exists. But then, you know, this is more a preterist view, right? I mean, the preterist view is this is fulfilled in the time of Christ, that the kingdoms of Bible prophecy that are here are Babylon, Medo, Persia, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and that it doesn't refer to the end of the world at all. It's just about the kingdom of grace. But Jeff here has taken, well, the kingdom of grace that was fulfilled then and that becomes a type of the kingdom of glory. And, and so that we, we take Daniel chapter 2 as being fulfilled during pagan Rome. And now we're going to take all of those and typically use them to refer to the last four kingdoms. Now, the thing is, we have no problem paralleling those kingdoms in that way. The question is, can we do that with Daniel chapter 2? Is that in Daniel chapter 2 that we see these eight kingdoms? And I don't think it exists in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 doesn't provide us with that detail. And we, we can sort of superimpose it. We can say, well, in that period that's in the foot of the image, we can now take these other visions that provide us with this detail. And we can see that. You know, Rome continues in these different forms, papal, the United States of America, and the UN, and then this renewed papacy. So we can all agree with that. So so this isn't really, to me, you don't need this argument from Daniel chapter 2 to argue about the seven, the eighth is of the seven. You wouldn't need Daniel chapter 2 to do that. But when he's using Daniel chapter 2 to do that in this way, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand why he would, he would do that with Daniel chapter 2 other than Parminder did it with Daniel chapter 2. And we looked a bit at Noel. Noel deals with these eight kingdoms, so to speak. The eighth is of the seven. But he's not using Daniel chapter 2 to do that. So, so that, that's the problem, right? So I know we, we're, we're addressing this problem here. And, and that's just a review. So that, that, that's the problem. Now, we have your, your paper that you sent me, which isn't uh, – it's not too bad. It's what, uh, seven pages only instead of 35. Um, so this one's, uh, the, the annotations that 
Ellen G. White Estates gives for manuscript one, 1852, correct? Is that what this is? Dwight? <clears throat> I don't hear you, unless you're not there. And, and this is really Spalding him again, uh, 2A to 3B. Not sure whether that is 2A. Okay, so if you're not there, I don't know what to do with this document, Dwight. <clears throat> okay, so Dwight's not there yet, I guess. Uh, he's gone away for a moment. Okay, so there's a note here. It says, one or more type copies of this document contain additional Ellen White handwritten interlineations, which may be viewed at the main office of the Ellen G. White estate. Now, so this, this document... Um, which comes from March 18th, 1852, is in um, the Spalding McGann collection. And um, these annotations, these notes, uh, were um, handwritten interlineations. So when Ellen White wrote these, I don't know. I don't know if they were written at the time or later on. Um, and, and also, I don't know what particular part with these, uh, these notations. Um, so we got par manuscript, paragraph one. Okay, the manuscript. So I don't. So you have March 14th, 1852. Dwight, you're still not there? Okay. Because I don't really understand these notes. Okay, so I can't look at them. I, I don't know how to interpret what, what I see here. I think these numbers here are the annotations. Okay. Um, so they got these in brackets. So these must be the annotations. This must be the vision itself. Well, maybe I'll just read this here. Okay. Thou wouldst not want to step out if thou knewest the situation. That desire was to disenthrone these kings, but that could not be, for kings must reign till Christ begins to reign. Okay. So here we have a statement of Ellen White, talks about uh, these kings that must reign till Christ begins to reign. So if we're going to take this in connection with... Um, now, the reason why... Um, we're supposed to be looking because this, this has to do with church craft and state craft. Um, I don't, I don't quite understand this document. So I don't see anything about church craft. Let's see. Church craft, not in that way. No. Okay, I don't know what to do. Anybody with ideas what I should do with this? Because the idea is that Jeff, in his article, um, here, I'll show you this. He's going to quote this manuscript. Um, now, it's from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1168. So, so if we take this statement here 
and I go here. So I'll show you what I'm doing. Right, so this this here I have is manuscript 63, 1899. Um, so there must be some other article that Dwight is referring to that, um, that that's in, so I'm not sure. Dwight, you're still not there. Uh, okay. So, is there some other statement in Spirit of Prophecy that could be referred to? That um, we have this great controversy statement. Maybe it's this. Ah, here it is. When the four angels let go. Okay, Christ will set up his kingdom. Ah. Okay, so... Let's try to figure this out. Um, so Jeff says, if the fourth kingdom of Iron in Daniel 2 was simply representing pagan Rome, where the compromise of Constantine is represented by the clay being turned into miry clay, did Christ set up a kingdom in that history, right? So he's just saying pagan Rome. So this is what we were discussing. Here, I better show that on the screen. Um, so he says if the fourth kingdom of iron in Daniel 2 is simply representing pagan Rome now could we take that position that the fourth kingdom of iron in Daniel 2 is only about pagan Rome is that ever a position that we've taken as Seventh-day Adventists The way that you're asking the question, I'd have to say no. No, because we haven't. I mean, I've never seen any Seventh-day Adventist paper or presentation that argues that the fourth kingdom in Daniel 2 is only pagan Rome. We all understand that it's pagan and papal Rome. Correct. Okay. Yeah. It's the It's total Rome. In all of its phases. Right. That's how it's always been understood. Okay. As Seventh-day Adventists. Now, preterists will say it just refers to pagan Rome. But they won't even put it pagan Rome later. They want it to be pagan Rome in the time of Christ. Right. Because they want it to be fulfilled in the time of Christ. But, but here he's going to uh, stretch it from pagan Rome all the way till 508 or 538 or something like that, right? So then he says, um, if this is the case, uh, did Christ set up his kingdom in that history? So he's going to argue the kingdom of grace is set up in that history. Um, the answer is yes, at the cross, which is the history of Pergamus, and not Thyatira. But we know the history of Pergamos is not at the cross, because that's the third church. But he, he's just saying since it's pagan Rome, and Pergamos is still in pagan Rome, 321, that's pagan Rome still, then, then we can just group it together, right? Which, which I have a hard time understanding that logic. But anyway, uh, there was an everlasting kingdom set up at the cross, and the throne of that kingdom typifies a throne that get up, gets set up during the latter reign. The latter reign throne represents his kingdom of glory, right? So he's going to take this idea. We know that Christ sets up his kingdom of glory at the cross. But the question is, is that what Daniel chapter 2 is talking about? We'd have to say no. It's not talking about Christ setting up his kingdom of glory. Right? It is addressing the kingdom that's yet future. Now, um, so so Dwight, you weren't here. I was trying to figure out why we were looking at this Spalding again. And it would be this quote here. So he, so Jeff says, 
Christ did set up an everlasting kingdom in the prophetic history of pagan Rome, not at the end of papal Rome. He also sets up his kingdom of glory at his second coming, which includes the history of the latter reign when the four winds of Islam are released. So then he's going to quote Spaldingham again. The latter rain is coming on those that are pure. All then will receive it as formerly. When the ang- four angels let go, Christ will set up his kingdom. None receive the latter rain, but those who are doing all they can. Christ would help us. All could be overcomers by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus. All heaven is interested in the work. Angels are interested. So, so this Christ will set up his kingdom. He's now saying, well, we can show that Christ set up his kingdom of grace at the cross. And then he's just jumping to this. Well, since this is all in the history of pagan Rome, not at the end of papal Rome, and he set up this everlasting kingdom then, that's what the stone smiting the foot of the image must be. But he also sets up his kingdom of glory at the second coming. So so if we um, go to your paper there, you're still there, Dwight. are you okay <clears throat> so I'll show you this Dwight are you there and you've gone again so to do this So that's paragraph six. Okay, so now if we look at this document. Thou wouldest not want to step out if thou knewest thy situation. That desire was to dethrone these kings, but that could not be, for kings must reign till Christ begins to reign. I saw in Europe just as things were moving to accomplish their desires. There would seemingly be slacking up once or twice. Uh, thus the hearts of the wicked world would be relieved and hardened, but the work would not settle down, only seem to. For the minds of kings and rulers were intent upon overthrowing each other, and the minds of the people to get the descendants. I saw that all minds were intensely looking and stretching their thoughts on the impending crisis before them. The sins of Israel must go to judgment beforehand. Every sin must be confessed at the sanctuary. Then the work will move. It must be done now. The remnant in the time of trouble will cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The latter rain is coming on those that are pure. All then will receive it as formerly. When the four angels let go, Christ will set up his kingdom. So this is the the part that Jeff is going to quote. He's also going to quote, of course, the latter rain is coming on those that are pure. So he's, he's making the argument that when the four angels are loosed, Christ will set up his kingdom, and that would be the kingdom of glory, which the kingdom of grace was typical of. Uh, none will receive the latter rain, but those who do all they can to water, water others with truth, eternal truth. Christ would help us. All could be overcomers by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus. All heaven is interested in the work. Angels are interested. So, so this here in brackets, um, so I don't know why it's in brackets here. Um, okay. thinking that, so, so I'm trying to understand this document and how it works. All right. So this is how the Jeff quotes. In the paper, and that's why you put this. How does this help us? I mean, it's pretty clear that Ellen White is not. There's nothing that indicates that she interprets Daniel chapter two as being fulfilled in the time of Christ. Correct. Quite the contrary. We can see that these kingdoms have to exist until Christ sets up his kingdom. So one of the things about it, his argument, if you think about it. 
It's smiting the foot of the image. The foot of the image is the kingdoms of this world. Even though Christ set up his kingdom of grace at the cross, you can't in any way make an argument that the kingdoms of this world uh, had a stone smite them and brought about their end. The stone smiting the image, the foot of the image, is addressing the kingdoms of this world. Christ setting up a kingdom of grace has nothing to do with removing the kingdoms of this world that we see here in this statement. Because those kingdoms continue until Christ sets up his kingdom. Okay, so Dwight, you got All right. yeah, what you're doing. To try to help understand some of this that's going on. Okay. When I went through this yesterday, there is the document that you're reading from here <clears throat> that is presented on the Ellen White website. Mm -hmm. But when why you, do they have some brackets here? None okay. receive a I don't understand why that's in brackets. Okay, come to page two and footnote two. Okay, so page two. There you go. Footnote two. So what this is giving reference okay. to is, go ahead. Okay, I see. One type copy of this manuscript dated May 3rd, 1903, bears Ellen White's handwritten in, into linear comments inserted in this text between those symbols, it in, indicating her acceptance of the contents. Okay, now does that resolve the question? Yeah, okay. So so it's not in the original manuscript, but Ellen White put that there. Now, so these footnotes, these are just the Ellen G. White estates making comments on the document. Right, right. <laughs> or some of these look like uh, Ellen White statements that are written in the interlineations. Okay, now... As I understand this, and I, I'm more than willing to be corrected, the first copy of Manuscript 1, 1852, that's pages 1 and part of page 2, mm -hmm. should be the copy that is found in the Spalding and McGann. The MS 1, 1852 that you're looking at here would be a different copy with a little bit more information, but both of them have reliance upon Manuscript 2, 1852, which you will find at the end of this document. Okay. So there's just these documents. Because um, there's a copy. Spalding and McGann's are a copy. So they don't have the original account that Ellen White gave. They have a copy of these manuscripts in their collection. Correct. So they managed to gather some of these copies that were floating around, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Right. So they, they put together these things. Now, Ellen White, um, like she makes a, a handwritten comment in 1903 so she's looking at an old copy of, of you know from maybe whether it's the original handwritten or just a copy of of that and she comments on it so so she has the, the ellen g white estate obviously collected some of these manuscripts and and ellen white goes through and writes notes on them. and and she dated that one right whether she always dated them i don't know Right. Now, the other thing that we need to keep in mind, at the, at the very top of page one, from the, the, the portion that is on the Ellen White Estate website, we have this note that runs on many of the documents that there is more than one copy of this document that contain Ellen White's handwritten notes. 
Right. So she had different copies of it and she would write notes on it. And those other copies are retained at the Ellen White website and have not been published. Well, yeah, at the LNG White Estate, not been published. Okay, now people can go to see them if you want to. But they just they just haven't published all of these handwritten notes on all of her documents. Right. And it seems this is something that she would do at times. She would go through older documents and make little notes on them herself. Right, because obviously she's doing that in 19, 1903 when she's writing that note. Um, right, so that's going to be uh, May 3rd, 1903. She Now, this is a type copy of, the, of this manuscript. So sometimes the copies, what they would have is they'd have the original handwritten copies of some of these things, right? right. And they would also type them out. Right. And they, and they would put that extra space in between there. And, and Ellen White would review these uh, type writ, typed out copies of some of her manuscripts. And then she would write notes in between them occasionally. Right, so that, that's what happens. Okay. Now with this document though, I mean, it's just pretty clear from what Jeff is quoting, because he's quoting this document and he's quoting uh, paragraph five and six and seven and collection. Uh, page three, it says. Um, but he's quoting this, the latter rain is coming on those that are pure. I'm reading it from Jeff's document. All then will receive it as formerly. When the angels let go, Christ will set up his kingdom. None receive the latter rain, but those who are doing all they can. Christ would help us. All could be overcomers by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus. All heaven is interested in the work. Angels are interested. So so that statement, um, um, doesn't have this part to water others with truth, eternal truth. It doesn't have that part in it. But otherwise, it's the in Spalding again. It's it's these three paragraphs, right? All of that, except with those between those. I would agree. Paragraphs. Okay. Now he's using this now because he's he's argued that well, Christ set up his kingdom of grace at the cross. And that's in the time of pagan Rome. And so Daniel chapter 2 only covers the period of pagan Rome. Right. So pagan Rome. And that it, it, it then can typify what happens at the end of the world. And he uses this statement that Christ sets up his kingdom at, at the end of the world. And so, but this, this is really just contradicting exactly what he said. Because this kingdom here is that these, um, because when we read this, right, the first paragraph of this document, thou wouldest not want him to step out out, if thou knewest thy situation. That desire was to disenthrone these kings, but that could not be, for kings must reign till Christ begins to reign. So, So Ellen White is placing Christ beginning to reign all the way to while there's still kings, the, you know, Christ is going to reign. And when he reigns, these kings no longer reign. And that didn't happen at the cross. Right. So you couldn't make that argument that Daniel chapter two is fulfilled at the cross. Because you can't have any kings after Christ sets up his kingdom. The most that we can do is we can say, well, the stone smites the foot of the image because the stone is cut out without hands. It smites the foot of the image and that this in a very broad way can refer 
to that whole period of the Christian church. I mean, we could we could say that. We could say the stone's made without hands. It's cut out without hands. And that, you could put that, that begins at the time of Christ. You could uh, can, uh, Brother Theodore, can you go yeah. back and say what you just previously said? Okay. So we could make an argument. If we were going to say that the stone smites the foot of the image in the time of Christ, we can't do that. But what we could argue is that the stone is cut out without hands, beginning in the time of Christ when he forms the Christian church, all the way to the period to the end of the world. That We could take the cutting out of the stone as referring to... Um, we can take the cutting out of the stone as referring to uh, a, something that begins in the time of Christ. But you can't have the, the stone smite the foot of the image in the time of Christ. Because that's, that's striking those kingdoms and bringing about the end of those kingdoms. So only in a very broad way could you... You take that whole phrase, the stones cut out of the mountain without hands, and then it strikes the foot of the image, and then it grows into this great mountain, right? So you could say, it, you know, it's describing this whole thing, but you couldn't just say the stone smites the foot of the image at the time of Christ. Right? So it's not providing us detail. It's providing this cutting out of the stone which would include the formation of the church. It would include all the history of Millerite history, etc. But the way that I've understood it is that primarily we would see that this is referring to the work that is in connect connection with the Day of Atonement. And you can see that she's going to start talking about that. The sins of Israel must go to judgment beforehand Every sin must be confessed at the sanctuary, right? So she's bringing in here the work in the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement in connection with this overthrowing of these kings. So then she's going to talk about the latter rain that's coming. So again, that's going to be connected with with this idea that these kings are going to be ended and Christ going to set up his kingdom. So you can't just say that she teaches the kingdom was set up at the time of Christ, the kingdom of grace, and that she says, well, the kingdom's also going to be set up at the end of the world. And that Daniel chapter two is just referring to the first one, the kingdom of grace, because it's clearly referring to Christ setting up his kingdom that she's talking about here and we can't just say well that's that's just because what happened in daniel 2 is typical it's the alpha and now at the end of the world this is the omega so so i don't know there's no way that this document supports what jeff is saying So I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to do anything other than to say that that it's just wrong. This this whole idea in this this uh, third article on the eighth is of the seventh. Dwight, you have any comments on that or anybody? Well, but I don't think. Go through the rest of the document is what I'm trying to say. Okay, go on. Well, that, you know, that's fine. I mean, I the the entire reason for presenting all of this was so that we could read through it and think for ourselves as to exactly what Elder Jeff is trying to say, and then what was said here by Mrs. White. I mean, the yeah. the case in point that we're dealing with right now is if Mrs. White is saying that Christ begins to reign when the other kings have been disenfranchised, isn't that, you know, 
an end to the discussion? Yeah, I would think so. But yeah, we know Christ set up his kingdom of grace, but that has nothing to do with the removal of the kings that we see in Daniel chapter two. Right. Right. In, in, in a sense, you can say, well, that's the beginning maybe of the stone being cut out with open hands or something like that. But it's definitely not. There's just no way you can interpret Daniel 2 in this way. As Seventh-day Adventists. And, and it's pretty clear that he's saying Daniel 2, it's fulfilled in the time of pagan Rome. And it's only as an application that we're going to take this parallel at the end of the world and then apply these other four kings as the, the mixture of churchcraft and statecraft. So it's saying the churchcraft and statecraft in Daniel chapter 2 is referring to something during the Pergamus period, which for some reason Christ the, the stone smiting the foot of the image at the cross of Christ is somehow connected to the Pergamus period, even though it's, you know, 300 years before. I, I just don't understand it. I mean, I'm truly puzzled to understand that article. And, and I don't know where it's going, right? Because we don't, we don't have, we know it's in a series of articles called the eight is of the seven. So why that why that argument would even be made, why Daniel chapter two is even brought into that, I don't know. But it, it's a completely foreign interpretation of Daniel two for Seventh Day Adventists. I mean, I might expect it from some modern scholarship, but I wouldn't expect it from somebody who believes in Miller's rules and, you know, is examining Millerite history. So. <clears throat> okay, so we need to move back to this study. So are people sort of satisfied? I'm going to send the documents to everyone. Um, I have a question. Yeah, okay. So one doesn't typify the other. No, you can't, because in a typification, you would say that Daniel 2 was fulfilled in the time of Christ. And so because of that, it's not addressing our period except as a typical history. So we would say, now we know the Sunday law in 321 does typify the Sunday law in our time. Right. So we know that that history does typify our history. So we're not arguing that it doesn't. What we're saying is that Daniel chapter 2 isn't just fulfilled in pagan Rome. Because you don't need it to be fulfilled in pagan Rome in order for it to typify that our I, history. That I agree with, but it's still typifying. Yes, it's still typifying. Okay, I'm just clarifying. But, but we don't need it fulfilled. I'm just clarifying. Yeah, we don't need Daniel chapter 2 fulfilled in, by pagan Rome alone in order for pagan Rome to typify our history, okay. right? Yep. Because we know all his histories typify the end of the world. So, so he doesn't need to make that argument. I mean, he could just simply say, "Here we have uh, the coming of Christ and the, and the destruction of Jerusalem. These typify events at the end of the world, and also the Sunday Law in the time of Constantine typifies the Sunday Law at the end of the world." And that would all be fine. We'd all agree with that. But you wouldn't need this interpretation of Daniel chapter 2 to say that. Do people understand what, what I'm saying? Please repeat what you just said. Okay. So we know that the, the first coming of Christ typifies the second coming of Christ, right? Correct. And we know that um, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, 70 AD typifies 
the destruction at the end of the world, right? Right. And we know that the Sunday law in 321 typifies the Sunday law at the end of the world. Okay. So we know all those things. But we would not need to interpret Daniel chapter 2 as merely being fulfilled by pagan Rome in order to draw those conclusions. In fact, it's immaterial right. to the argument. Agreed. Well, my wife agrees with me, so I must be right. I don't know. <laughs> That's, That's what right. I mean. <laughs> so, um, so we can see, he, he can make an argument that the eighth is of the seven without reverting to this interpretation, this preterist interpretation of Daniel chapter two. It's just not needed to, to make the argument that he's making and lining up Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome with the papacy, USA, UN, and the resurrected papacy. Right? There's, there's no reason to interpret Daniel chapter two in that way to get what we see in front of us. It's just that we know that Daniel chapter two does not provide those details. We need to look at the other prophecies. So, so we can say, well, Daniel chapter two has these legs of iron. Those legs of iron, there's two of them, right? And we, we often say that's pagan and papal Rome, right? Now, in uh, the 1843 chart, they just call it all pagan Rome. So they put pagan Rome as the legs. So maybe that's correct. Maybe the legs don't represent pagan and papal Rome. Maybe they represent, you know, uh, something to do with the form of Roman government. I don't know. But then you're going to see the feet. The feet are going to have this characteristic of iron and clay. And it's not, you know, pure clay and then miry clay. It's just iron and clay. And then they're going to have ten toes. And we know that the ten toes represent the, end, the world in this divided state when Christ comes. There isn't this unified, you know, Babylon or Medo-Persia, Greece, or Rome, even in that sense, that there's this division. Now, this division of Rome occurs when Rome is conquered by uh, these, um, these Germanic tribes, right? And there's arguments in Millerite history. How do, how do we count these, you know, these different 10 divisions? Now, I don't think it's actually that important to find actual 10 because I just think it's a symbol of the completeness of the world. So 10 is a symbol of the world, of the governments of the world. But da Daniel chapter 2 does not provide all of these details that we that we are adding to it. Right. It's really just Rome all the way through. There's nothing here that's distinguishing out. Pay, papal Rome as a separate thing, or um, the United States, or the UN, or the resurrected papacy. It's not giving us those details, and it doesn't need to. Now, it seems that Jeff is argu arguing, since it doesn't provide those details of those latter four kingdoms, that it must be fulfilled in the time of pagan Rome. But that, that's not really logical. Just because it doesn't provide details doesn't mean that those kingdoms don't exist in that image because the smiting of the foot of the image with the stone, according to the spirit of prophecy, and of course, if we, we follow through the logic of all these visions, they all come to the end of the world in some way. Now, they bring us to a little bit different places at the end of the world. But they still are bringing us to the end of the world. Okay. So, so I think I think for me, I, I'm very satisfied. But of course, you know, I'm the one doing the study. 
But I'm satisfied with this idea. And if people aren't, I want people to write on the video and explain why they're not satisfied with my interpretation of what Jeff is doing, either what Jeff is doing, or how to understand Daniel chapter 2. And again, I'm going to send out uh, the documents. I'm going to put them into PDF, the documents that uh, Dwight has given us here. And people can look at them. They can examine Jeff's article. They can examine uh, this manuscript that Jeff is quoting from, and they can make it draw their own conclusions regarding this. Um, okay, so um, so what do you want to look at Esther five for William? So William's just saying, can we look at Esther five? What do you want to look at in Esther five? Well. Um... We had you associated um, audit searches with um, Trump in verse five, right? In 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 Esther, in verse, I mean in in chapter five, Esther yeah, chapter so, five. Yeah. So in in Esther, what we what we're saying is that Artic Xerxes or Xerxes, pardon me, Xerxes in the book of Esther is Trump. Okay. Well. Um, we we in this movement have said when a king holds out the scepter to God's church, is that not representing Christ? Yeah, we understand that Xerxes represents is a Christ-like figure. Well, that would, that would that would that would that would mean that Trump wouldn't be represented right there, would he? Well, yeah, and it's not the church so much because Esther doesn't represent the church as much as she represents the third angel's message in that section of Esther chapter five. Yeah, so that's why I'm saying it doesn't make sense that Trump, if we're going to take Esther in the book of Esther, that Xerxes represents Trump, that Trump is the one that brings in the Sunday law. Right? I understand that, but we we associated it a king that holds out the scepter, even though you say that she, she's not the church. She yeah, yeah. Rep yeah. represents the third angel's message. Right? right. Yeah, I understand. So well, that would be the church, wouldn't it? Well, in a certain sense, but, but the, the point is. The well, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get, what I ask you is, is Artic Xerxes, if when he still holds out the scepter, is he Trump or is he Christ? He's Trump. So but Trump is going to hold also Christ. So because you're saying Trump is Christ too, then? Okay. Is Cyrus Christ? He's a typifies Christ. Christ. Yes. And so does Artic Xerxes, right? Xerxes, you mean? Yeah. Well, Xerxes, well, yeah. they're both the same, right? Yeah. So we're just talking about a typification. So right. that action typifies Christ, but we also apply it to Trump. So that means that Trump in this history must be accepting in some way of the third angel's message. So, so, he we're, saying, uh, so we're saying that our, our Xerxes is the same all the way through Esther. Yeah, so Xerxes. But so yeah, Artic, well, Artic Xerxes. Xerxes, not Artic Xerxes. Xerxes. Xerxes, all right. Yeah, so Xerxes is representing Trump in the book of Esther. And so he's in chapter five, he's representing Christ and Trump. Is what you're saying, right? Well, if yeah, so let me repeat. Yeah, so just listen to what I'm saying. Okay. In the first three chapters of the book of Esther. Right. We we have the history of Trump up until the time that he's deposed, right? Right. Okay. So we can clearly see that that Trump is deceived during the time of the pandemic. Right? Because that's when the Sunday law is going to be issued. And then chapter 4 onward, we're going to see Xerxes again. Now, Xerxes in that context, and, and, and all through it, Xerxes typifies, we have in chapter one, Xerxes typifies Christ. This is what Jeff taught. 
But he also says that Xerxes is Trump. Okay. So, so there's some way in which Xerxes actions and Trump act- actions are typification of the work of the gospel. All right. All so right. Trump, in this case, can't be the one who brings in the Sunday law. He was deceived in the pandemic and and initially is deceived, but then a message comes that undeceives him, right? All right, All right. well, you answered my question. That message, that me- yeah, and that message is going to come in chapter four, five, six, et cetera, and, and, and there's going to be an undoing of what was done by Xerxes, so Xerxes. So if Xerxes is representing Trump in that history, one thing we can clearly see is that Xerxes is not bringing in the Sunday law in that history, right? The history that's followed. So if we're gonna say, now now Xerxes in some ways could be representing Trump or he could be representing something broader, but I don't know. Right, because we're looking at something that hasn't happened yet with Trump and how we're going to interpret it. But when we started looking at, you know, chapter four, chapter five, all these things, we could see that there is this representation of the first, second, and third angels' message, and that Xerxes has these two points in when he lifts out the golden scepter. And so we have the one where he accepts Esther and listens to her her appeal, you know, to come to this banquet, all that kind of thing. And then it happens again when the counter decree is issued. And so if there is a counter decree and we believe that Xerxes represents Trump, then Trump issues a counter decree to the Sunday law. But that would mean he would have to be president, right? Possibly, unless we, we unless we put that in what happened in the time of the pandemic. So we could say, well, that maybe happened earlier, right? And when he sort of opposed, you know, Fauci and, and that type of stuff. But we don't know. And it could be, he doesn't necessarily have to be president in that sense either. Um, it could be just simply that, you know, Trump ends up becoming converted in some way. I don't know. We'll see as it unfolds what okay. actually means. Well, thank you. You answered my question. Yeah. But but this is the, the, the yeah. So the very simple thing that you can see there in Esther chapter five and onward is that Trump, he doesn't bring in a Sunday law. Right. So. So I don't I'm not quite sure how we. One is that we have to have him to be president to bring in the Sunday law. He doesn't need to become president again. Uh, because he does, he's already been president. So Xerxes already typifies Trump. So I don't see that he even has to become president for this part. It could be just simply supporting this opposition or, or, or being in opposition to this Sunday law. Even as a citizen, I mean, as who used to be president. So, so there's lots of different ways in which that could possibly be fulfilled. <clears throat> okay, so that was a departure from the study today, but I'm glad you asked it so we could clarify that. So now we're looking at, um, at these lines again of these kings. So, and, and we still have a lot of work to do here. So back in 2013, uh, we had a um, a presentation that Jeff did on the number four. And what it was, was a presentation about the four seven times. So this was in August of 2013. So this is in Sylvan Lake, Alberta, camp meeting. And, and Jeff argues that Manasseh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, that in their histories, the four seven times are fulfilled, that the first seven times is fulfilled in the time of Manasseh, the breaking of the pride of the power, that the 
second seven times that wild beasts shall rob you of your children is fulfilled with the captivity of Daniel in the time of Jehoiakim. That the, the, the ten women shall break, bake the bread in one oven and that ye shall eat this bread that is delivered to you by weight. That's fulfilled with Jehoiachin's captivity. And that the fourth seven times, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, is fulfilled in the time of Zedekiah. That's with his captivity. Now, what that had done is it had set up this idea that we have these last seven kings of Judah, right? So you can see them there at the bottom of this slide once I share it. Oops, that's not right. Okay. Right? So you can see that there. Uh, maybe I had it shared. I don't know. Um, but you can see that right there at the bottom. We got Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah. And then I also put Christ there. I guess we don't need this here. Now, I put Christ as the eighth, because you're going to have that overturn, overturn, overturn it until he come who's right it is. Okay? Um, so this becomes the model, because this is 2013. So this is prior to us studying the first seven kings of Persia. Right? And we would look at these, these kings. So then he's going to start developing that, though. Right. So in 2013, he presents these four, seven times in the context of these last seven kings. So he notices these last seven kings of Judah. And then from 2013 into 2014 and then into 2015, we're going to develop this understanding. So in May of I guess it's May 10th, 2015, Noel does a presentation on. Um, Related to this, right? Related to these kingdoms. But, um, um, or does his study deal with these? I can't remember now. Anyway, I know that by the time of 2015, uh, we're looking at these, these, and maybe even 2014, we're looking at these four, uh, the four seven times within these seven periods. And, um, and then we're making a parallel with the first seven kings of Persia. And when we line them up, we line up Manasseh with Cyrus. So we don't line Manasseh up with Darius the Mede. Right? Because if we lined up to Manasseh with Darius the Mede, we'd have eight kings of Persia getting to Artaxerxes. Now, you know, maybe in some way, maybe, maybe we're doing it wrong. I don't know. But... That's how we were doing it. And then Stephen brought up that Jeff had uh, lined up Manasseh with Reagan because Reagan forgets uh, about the papacy, about identifying Antichrist. But if we line up with Manasseh with Reagan, we also line up Reagan with Darius the Mede. But we don't line up Manasseh with Darius the Mede. We line up Manasseh with Cyrus. So we're going to have to sort through these things and figure out how to do it. Now, if we count Reagan as number one, you know, Trump is number six on that line, right? So the second line there. But if we count Bush as number one, uh, Trump is number five. And then we have this, this thing with, you know, the five are fallen, one is. So when we get to call and study, and it's going to deal with Revelation 17, you know, the question is, where do we count that five are fallen? Where are we in time? Because that's what been one of the big issues with Revelation 17, is where where are we counting from when we say five are fallen? Well, Theodore, can I ask a question about it? Okay. Well, if Trump is five, that would lay that would line him up with the papacy, wouldn't it? <clears throat> as far as kingdoms. Do 
So yeah, so you're doing something because here, okay, what am I doing? Lining, we're not lining them up with the kingdoms at this point, right? So you're you're kind of jumping ahead because I don't think that's how Colin did it. You understand what I'm saying? That he applied the riddle to the king to the presidents of the United States. But he wasn't wasn't lining him up with the kingdoms. You don't see them anywhere here. Okay. All right. So to understand that Colin was not lining up the kingdoms with the president. And and Jeff is not doing that. We're not doing that. Okay. Right? So when he takes the riddle of Revelation 17, he's not lining up you know, the first king with the first kingdom. They're separate. Okay, I'll just, I'll just check, I'll just um, ask. Okay, yeah, because I know this was a confusion that happened, I believe it was uh, Daniel Fontenot when Colin first presented this, and he was trying to figure out, how are you doing this? You know, because he's thinking about the kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, you know, five are fallen, one is, and they were arguing and talking about, could have even been uh, uh, Bud mentioning it too or something. But anyway, they were a little bit confused about that because Colin was not lining up the presidents of the United States with the kingdoms, wasn't making a parallel between them. He was taking Revelation 17 and simply interpreting, using that riddle, and now applying it to the presidents of the United States. That's my understanding of what he was doing. Right? So he, he's taking, taking the president of the United States and applying the riddle to it. Whether that was the best thing to do or not is still something to be determined. But what we already had done is we had lined up the kings of Persia, the presidents of the United States, the emperors, the first seven kings of um, of Israel, the last seven kings of Israel, the first seven kings of Judah, the last seven kings of Judah, all these things were lined up. And it was based upon the idea of the seven thunders. Now then, in the trying to apply these to um how we're going to look at the kingdoms, I think that becomes that becomes a bit problematic. We have to just decide how we would do that if we're going to do that. But I don't think that's what Colin did. I don't think he was arguing that the kingdoms are parallel with the presidents. Well, would Ronald Reagan fit with um, Babylon? No. He- so I'm saying none of these fit as far as I can see. There would be no no reason to do that. What he's doing is he's saying that this is me to Persia, right? And we can take okay. Persian kings. I just I just asked a question, Theodore. I, I know. I understand. You don't need to apologize when you ask a question. Just ask the question, I'll answer. So so we know that the United States is parallel with me to Persia. Right? So that's something that we can clearly see. We can line up the time of the end. 539 to 537 it is with Medo-Persia. And we can line that up if we want to, 1989, 1991 or something like that, right? We, we can take that history. And we know under Bush first, we're going to have the New World Order speeches, right? He's going to be talking about the New World Order. Um, and so in some ways, there there's definitely is a parallel between Cyrus and Bush the first. Okay, there's a parallel between Darius the Mede and Reagan. And if we're going to talk about the first seven kings of Persia, Cyrus, Cambyses, False Myrtus, Darius the first, Xerxes, Artabanus as the sixth, and then Artaxerxes as the seventh, that that is how we did it. We did not <coughs> put Darius as the first, Cyrus as the second, Cambyses as the third, False Myrtus as the fourth. 
Darius the first is the fifth, Xerxes is the sixth. Ignore Artabanus, maybe you could say, well, we, we, we should have done it that way because Artabanus wasn't really the king. And then Artaxerxes is the seventh still. Or, you know, you could have had Artabanus as the seventh and Artaxerxes is the eighth. You know, you could have made that type of argument. But we never did. What we did is we said the first king of Persia is Cyrus, because that's reality. And, and so we counted up to Artaxerxes. Now, then when we made the application of Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, to there are three yet king, yet three kings to stand up in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all, and he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. We have a different count, but that count is not the count of the seven. It's just simply a count from Cyrus saying there's going to be Cambyses, false Smyrtus, and Darius the first. And then we're going to have a fourth one, Xerxes. And he's going to stir up all against the realm of Grecia. He's going to lose to Greece. We know that. And so the next thing mentioned is not Artabanus or Artaxerxes, but it's going to be Alexander the Great. It's going to be Greece. So if the United States is Persia, we wouldn't have Greece as a continuation of that line. It would be a new line. Right? So when we get to Alexander, we're now going to have a completely different line using Greece as a type of what happens at the end of the world. And then Rome's going to come in, pagan Rome, and it's going to be a type of what happens at the end of the world. And then papal Rome is going to come in, and it's going to be used as a type. Now, in all of those, what you do is you interpret the history that's written in the prophecies. And then you take that history that's, that's fulfilling those prophecies, and it becomes typical. That is, it illustrates something at the end of the world. What you don't do is you don't interpret, apply the prophecy as a prophecy at the end of the world. Because that prophecy is only understood in its fulfillment. Would we agree with that? In the context it was intended for, yes. Right? Yeah. So we would we would have it fulfilled, and now that history in connection with that prophecy will be fulfilled. Or will be repeated, I should say. So the history that was fulfilled by that prophecy, that prophecy was given. It was fulfilled by a certain history, and that history is going to be repeated. The prophecy itself is not repeated. Because if I repeated the prophecy, I can repeat it in, in different kinds of ways. I can interpret it in different ways, right? I can use the symbols and apply that, that, that prophecy in in different ways, I can do things like, well, it talks about, um, you know, symbolic days, you know, day for a year, but I'm going to apply it as literal days, right? This is what the Protestants do when they look at prophecy. And this is what Adventists have done who are doing time setting. They look at the prophecy. They said it had its fulfillment in the past, maybe. But we're going to reapply that prophecy at the end of time in some kind of usually literal fashion. But that's not how we study prophecy. Right. So are people in agreement with what I'm saying? I know my wife is. What you're saying has a very logical application. Yeah. And it's how we've done it. Mm -hmm. Those are the rules we follow to, to do it. This is what this movement has done. This is what Seventh-day Adventism always has done. Consistently done. Yeah. So, so we can't just take these prophecies and interpret them. And so when Colin did his presentation on December 25th, 2021, and I'd missed the first part of it, and I just asked a simple question. Did he accept 
the historical understanding that uh, the king that shall do according to his will, a king shall do according to his will. It, I guess it says there, uh, um, how does it say it now? I'm trying to remember the exact words. of Daniel 11, verse 3. Um, a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And I just ask, does that still apply to Alexander the Great in its historical application? And he wouldn't answer it, no, because he thought he had answered it earlier. And me asking the question, he was like, I was being um, argumentative or something. But I just wanted to know. And then he wouldn't answer it, which I was surprised. Like, well, this is pretty important. Now, the thing is, if we accepted that this is Alexander, historically, then we would have to use this history, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 3, and we would say, well, how, how would we apply that history to our time? And we, and we couldn't argue, at least I don't think you can argue, that this mighty king that stands up, which is a, a mighty king that stands up, so it's not the same king, it can't be Xerxes. It's going to be some king in the future. And we look at the characteristics and we can see this doing according to his will is something that shows up with uh, Medo-Persia in Daniel chapter 8. It shows up with Rome later in Daniel chapter 11. It shows up with the papacy again later in, in Daniel chapter 11. That this is a characteristic that we would have to apply to the papacy in, in some way, that it's it's dealing with this kingdom at the end of the world. And, you know, maybe, maybe a person could figure out some way in which to apply this to Trump. But it doesn't follow, because when we took Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, and we interpreted this, as these kings of Persia as being applied to the presidents of the United States. Alexander the Great is not a king of Persia. So Jeff, in order to put Alexander the Great as Trump, said, well, Trump, after he becomes president, he's then going to become the leader of the United Nations. So, so that's how Jeff interpreted it. Right. And on two occasions, I had a discussion with Jeff about this, where I, ex where I explained why I didn't think it made sense. Right. And he could understand how I could see that. But he still wanted to hold on to that that's going to be Trump. And this, this is in 2018 that I had these conversations with him. So. So anyway, it's just that is sort of left over from this interpretation that Trump was going to bring in the Sunday law. And since he was going to bring in the Sunday law, he would have to become this mighty king that's going to bring in this Sunday law. But there's just other ways in which we could interpret this. We could say what we're doing right now is we're looking at a new line of prophecy. We're now looking at a characteristic that's being given to Greece that was originally seen in Medo-Persia in chapter 8. And it's going to be given to Rome, and it's going to be given to papal Rome. So it's some kind of characteristic that comes from Medo-Persia that has to do with laws, and, and it's going to morph or change into what we see at the end of the world when it comes to the Sunday law. That's how I would understand this. If, if we're going to make an application, it doesn't make sense to apply it to a person. Now, there was this whole thing, this whole discussion here about this, um, dealing with the transition. Why are we going, we're saying that these Persian kings refer to presidents, but now this mighty king doesn't refer to a person. But can we see that these are two completely different applications? 
One is the kings of Persia. The king of Greece, Alexander the Great, definitely typifies something, but he doesn't need to typify an individual person. Can we see that? Because when you have a king that does according to his will, does it, does it typify an individual person or does it just typify a kingdom? I would almost think that it typifies a kingdom. Yeah. So when we talk about, um, so where is this here? Um, I'm trying to find it uh, right here in verse four. And I saw a ram pushing westward and northward, southward, so that no beast could stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So are we taking this as an individual or are we taking this as Medo-Persia? It has to be taken as Medo-Persia. Right, because there's two horns here even. Correct. Medo and Persia. Nothing that would give apply this to an individual. We're not going to say this is Cyrus or this is, you know, Darius the Mede or Darius the Persian or, or any individual person. Then in chapter 11, we have this, of course, again, he does according to his will. And then it's in verse... 16, that he that cometh again against him shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him. Now, we take this as Rome. We don't take it as any individual person. Right? Agreed. Okay. Now this, so this, is, this is Rome. It's gonna, he's going to stand in the glory. It's not an individual person. When we get to uh, verse 36, and the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify. We don't apply this to any particular pope. We don't say this is Clovis or this is uh, the other guy, whatever his name was. I always forget his name. Um, Justinian or something like that. We just say this is the papacy. Right? So there's no reason to, to say that we've somehow made a change that we have to explain why uh, verse 2 is referring to um, kings. Well, it's plainly tell us that these are three kings that are going to yet stand up in Persia and a fourth. So these are referring to individuals, even in the literal application of it. And we've taken those seven Persian kings and we've lined them up with the presidents of the United States. Right? Because we've lined them up in different ways. So we have to line them up with seven kings. Now, the weird thing is in our interpretation when we got to this count here, we just said it goes to Trump as being the fourth, right? And that fourth is really going to be the fifth because Cyrus is obviously the first Persian king. So Trump's the fifth Persian king, but we weren't looking for a sixth or a seventh applying to the presidents of the United States. And that seems to me not really logical that we did that, but we did that because that's where God had led us to at the point, at that point. So we should be able to see that, you know, we would put Biden in here. Right, so I'm just copying this here. Biden is Artabanus. If we're going to line up these presidents, with these kings. Now we don't know what the seventh one is, 
right? But you would have a seventh after Biden. Who knows? Could be Trump. Maybe Trump becomes president again. You know, possibly. But the point is, he's not the one who brings in the Sunday law, whoever that seventh is. I mean, it's not about a person, right, bringing in the Sunday law. All we know is that we have these seven, these seven kings. You know, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe it, you know, maybe the next president's going to bring in the Sunday law. I don't know. But the other thing is we have an eighth. Now, in Collins' interpretation, he's going to make Trump the eighth because his count is going to be different. So we kind of have to look down here for this count in the second one. Right, so Trump is the sixth. Biden's the seventh. And then Trump is going to be the eighth. And he's one of the seven is how he interprets instead of he's saying he's of the seven. It's one of the seven. He's interpreting it that way. <clears throat> okay. So anyway, we're done for today. So. We're going to come and look at these things again tomorrow. Any any final thoughts? I know we went a little bit late, but okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study. And um, Lord, we know that we know so little, and maybe we're adamant about some of the things that we see, and maybe we are wrong. We ask, Lord, that you can correct us according to thy word. And we pray that uh, those who are studying these videos uh, can write comments, um, correcting us, pointing us to the scriptures. Um, we want to understand your word, and we know that uh, we need your Holy Spirit to do it. So we ask for your continued guidance and help as we study together. Be with us until we meet again. According to thy will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.